This is Our Voices. I'm Mario Trimble. In order to be a place where everyone in our community feels valued and connected, we first have to ensure everyone believes they belong. These are Our Voices, a joint podcast production from the Colorado and Denver Bar Associations, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusivity Joint Steering Committee. Our Voices shines a light on the unique stories, experiences, and backgrounds of our member leaders so that we can help each other walk together. Sheldon Spotted Elk is a judge on the Ute Indian Tribe Court of Appeals and the new program director for Tribal Justice Partnerships with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. Sheldon is a powerful advocate for tribal communities with extensive experience in the areas of tribal and juvenile law, as well as child welfare. The richness of Sheldon's work belies the richness of his background and culture. He and his two sons are members of the Northern Cheyenne tribe. Sheldon's father grew up on a reservation and didn't hear or speak English until he went to school. His mother grew up in a predominantly white Mormon community in Ogden, Utah. Listen in as our own Courtney Holm and Linda Moss discuss his life, the challenges of code switching, his thirst for equity and justice, and the intersectionality of culture and law. Welcome to today's podcast. We're excited for our guest today. I'm Courtney Holm. I'm an attorney and mediator at Courtney Holm and Associates PC up in Edwards, Colorado. And my co-host today is... I'm Linda Moss. I'm a family law attorney with Coombe Curry Rich and Jarvis. And today we are excited to be speaking with Sheldon Spotted Elk. He is Native American and sits as an appellate judge for the Ute Tribal Court of Appeals and is also a consultant on child dependency and delinquency issues. Welcome, Sheldon. Yeah, thank you so much, Courtney. It's good to be on, uh, Linda. It's good to see you. It's good to be on. Thank you. We're so excited to have you here today. Thank you so much for talking with us, Sheldon. Um, So let's jump right in. Uh, As you know, um, on our podcast, we really love to kind of deep dive into our interviewees' lives. (laughs) So we're going to start with, who were you? Who were you as a kid? Where did you grow up? And uh, what was that like? Well, that's, I like the, even the past context of it, who were you? Um, I think... uh, (laughs) Well, I I grew up in a kind of have an interesting background, maybe unique background, um, and maybe the story of the West. The Western United States runs through uh, who I am. Um, So I'm Northern Cheyenne. Uh, It's a tribe based out of uh, Lame Deer, Montana, which is about 100 miles east of Billings, Montana. Um, We're the tribe that killed George Armstrong Custer in the Battle of Little Bighorn. So that's our big gift to humanity. Uh, You're welcome for that. Uh, And so... (laughs) Um, and that's my father's side, and that's where I get my last name spotted up from. Um, and I'll I'll tell you a little bit more about where that comes from. Um, in Cheyenne, Moe, Hawaii, is how you say it in Cheyenne. Um, and so that that comes again? from my Moe, Hawaii, and that's uh, spotted elk. Elk with spots, you know. So that's what that's saying. Um, and then on my mom's side, she's non-native, um, but she's. She grew up in Utah. Uh, my mom and dad grew up in different planets altogether. My dad grew up on a reservation, didn't speak English, or probably even saw white people until he went to school uh, as a six-year-old. Um, and so my mom, she grew up in Lily White, uh, Ogden, Utah. Um, she's a descendant of Mormons that the pioneers, like so her, her ancestors are like Mormon number, member number six or something like that. So like I grew up <laughs> in this kind of intersection of uh, intersectionality, if you will. Uh, of those two worlds. I, interesting enough, I was born in Oklahoma, but I grew up down in southern Utah uh, in the Four Corners area um, in this small town. Um, my dad was a school teacher on the Navajo Reservation, um, and we ended up living down there. Um, so it's kind of a little bit about my background. I grew up in this funny community where, and I, well, I was aware of it at the time. I, I don't want to over-exaggerate and say I was I was so innocent of it at the time, but I, I was keenly aware of the racism that was in that town of non-natives to native uh, communities. And I think it's also just a microcosm of the history of the United States relationships with American Indians. And so I think that was a, I, I had a thirst for justice. I think growing up uh, as a young child, I heard some of these conversations at my dinner table um, and I didn't know exactly how to express that thirst for 
or how to quench that thirst to stay consistent with the metaphor. I didn't know exactly how to quench that thirst. And I think sometimes, I don't know, I tried to do it in sports or like uh, try to find equity in those kind of arenas. And, um, and I had a lot of friends that were like, I, I'm very aware of the fact that like, I don't think anything about me is special or unique in that sense. Um, because I had friends that were way t more talented, way more smart, uh, way more artistic, uh, uh, way more engaging. Um, and, and unfortunately, just uh, I think opportunity and, and the lack of opportunity and, and the community that I grew up in really uh, put some of my friends that I grew up with on this pipeline to prison. Um, and it mm -hmm. ended up being manifested um, an early death. There is. American Indian men actually have a really lower mortality rate than the general population. And, and definitely I, I saw that with my friends that growing up and it had a big impact on me and I think made me want to try to do something uh, to address that. And I ended up finding, finding law as, as that something to try to have some impact. Wow. So I'm really curious, sorry to pull you backwards a little bit, but you mentioned that um, your parents came from extremely different communities. And I'm, I'm curious, how did they encounter each other? How did they come to be together? <laughs> yeah, that's the, the story of, I, I'm stealing this from somebody and I can't remember who I'm stealing it from, but they're the, the story of the flying fish and the sweeping crane, you know, like, um, so they're, Lives only inter they couldn't really coexist in each other's environments, but but unfortunately, like uh, I, I don't think my mom necessarily could. Uh, it was hard for her to live in a tribal community, uh, and I think my dad really tried his best to live in a non-Indian community. Um, and he went and got an education, and I think tried his best to um, I, I go across the aisle and work in uh, non-Indian communities. But um, I, I know it was very difficult for him to find employment, number one, to find employment. Mm -hmm. And and so he eventually, he was in business, actually. He started, that was his background, the educational backgrounds in business, but I think he became very despondent of that and became a school teacher, an elementary school teacher. And there was a big emphasis on education in our house uh, growing up. Um, but how they met, I guess I'm avoiding the question. How they, <laughs> I'm not avoiding it. I just, um, how they met is, um, the, it's an urban legend, I guess, and I don't even know for sure if this is true. And so this is what I've been told, um, is that wow. my dad, uh, when he graduated high school, um, he spoke with his mom. First, he, I think he went to an Indian school in Kansas, and he went there for a while. Um, and then his grandmother, um, there were some Mormon missionaries that came by our house. And we, our house in Montana, uh, they grow alfalfa, and I guess these were some country Mormon missionaries, and they... And my grandmother said, where do those kids go to school? And they said, oh, they go to BYU. Um, and so my dad jumped on a bus with a couple <laughs> bucks in his pocket and went down to BYU. And met, And I get, uh, from what I hear, he's, he, it was really tough for him to bridge that down at BYU. And a lot of American Indians were going to the BYU at that time, Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. Mm -hmm. um, and he was just on the verge of quitting and dropping out of school and going back home when he met my mom. And, um, and then my mom kind of helped. Uh, I guess, translate culture for him and translate uh, how to succeed as a student, I guess, because it is coded so heavily in, in whiteness. Uh, <laughs> the way we write, the way we speak, the way that academia promotes all that, of course, that's all uh, mm -hmm. coded in whiteness. And so um, he did have a struggle with that. And, and my mom was able to help translate some of that. So that's what I understand the story to be. I might have that wrong, though. <laughs> Some extremely successful Mormon missionary. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm right. curious about um, your interpretation when you say um, coded in whiteness, because it sounds like your dad um, didn't grow up in a white community, but he was exposed to English language and, and some of that type of education as a fairly young child. So how was that different for him then when when he got to college and was still feeling, it sounds like he was still feeling um, different and and kind of othered? Um, for sure. And I, we were the prep for this, we, we kind of had that conversation, but there is a term for 
um, being able to translate in other communities. It's that a code switch. And I, I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but mm-hmm. um, what it has to actually it comes out of language. And so if you're a, uh, if your second language is whatever the dominant language is, uh, knowing the codes, so to speak, uh, to dial into the community. And of course, in the legal community, there's a code that we speak. Um, and sure. when we say a word, we, we think we all know what that means and we're all on the same page. And it might be to the to the lay person, they might not understand what the hell we're even talking about, of course. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think, uh, of course, in dominant culture, dominant white culture, um, there's a code, and especially in academia, uh, especially to succeed in law school, there is a way to write. Um, we're, we're trained in it, right? We take classes mm-hmm. in it. It's our first year class to learn how to write like a lawyer. Um, and if you come from another writing background, uh, your your paper is going to bleed a lot. <laughs> so uh, there's a whole yeah. other <laughs> there's a whole other approach to it to be an effective legal writer. Um, and so um, I, I think as lawyers, we kind of understand that there's a different arena that you have to operate in versus the going your day to day buddies that you might hang out with that are non lawyers. Um, but definitely as a, with American Indians. And other races, for that matter, other ethnic ethnic backgrounds, like um, there is codes, not just necessarily in language, but in behavior um, and the way that we carry ourselves. Um, and there's a good quote that I I always reflect on. It's a quote by an, an Indian educator, and she just talks about the struggle that it is sometimes to articulate Indian issues and Indian problem problems that exist in our communities to non-Indians because they rarely ex- share the same experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and so oftentimes when we try to articulate the experience to a non-Indian audience, uh, it always appears that, oh, man, these Indians are crying about another thing or they're complaining about another thing, you know. So um, and so it is sometimes difficult to make a bridge to to help. So we're all speaking a common language. And, mm-hmm. and I don't think that's necessarily exclusive to the American Indian experience. But I, I think a lot of uh, sure. Greeks just share that they become the target. We become the target when I'm trying to say, "Oh yeah, this is an issue in Indian country," and, and then all of a sudden, because oh man, Sheldon, Sheldon's the issue. He that guy's always crying about something, you know. Like he, he always has something he's he's complaining about. Um, but Explaining we're the lived to... experience that makes someone else feel uncomfortable because it challenges their view of the world, then causes them to challenge you back and say, "Well, your lived experience." is really just you complaining about things that have been hard for you. For sure. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Well, and, and Sheldon, you mentioned code switching, and, and certainly you grew up in a multicultural setting. You had a mother from a Mormon Caucasian background, a father from Northern Cheyenne. And I, I believe when you were talking about growing up in, uh, in Utah, that was on the Navajo or near the Navajo uh, reservation. So how was it for you to try to, code switch so to be so to speak to fit in depending on where you were yeah and i and i i don't know it's, it's sometimes hard for me to admit that but of course that's what i did um because it is kind of taken away from my authenticity um but but i think i i got in a lot of trouble when i was growing up like i i was exposed to the delinquency system uh, and I, um and i think some of that was just me being an authentic young kid, you know, a young kid that uh, came from a mixed race background that saw, uh, I, I think kids are so authentic and they, they know when people are BS in them uh, better than adults do. I think as adults, we become conditioned to it, you know, like, um, <laughs> but as kids, we're just straight authentic. And I look back to the, some of the things that I was getting in trouble for, or getting suspended from school. Um, my little thing is from third grade to eighth grade, Every year, I was either in in-house suspension or actually suspended from school, um, and so I I had a lot of school issues. Um, not only, but then I also had uh, police issues <laughs> as well. Um, but I, I think looking back on that, some of that was just me trying to be a kid. Uh, and uh, of course, kids need mentorship, you know. And so. I think some of the adults in my life at the time or teachers in my life at the time didn't necessarily say, do you want, uh, let's take this kid under our wing and instead of suspending them, let's, mm-hmm. let's teach them. I was going to say, I'm sure that being suspended helped your school performance, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, so well, I, and Sheldon, you, you know, you mentioned that there was kind of a pipeline to prison 
um, in the native culture and, and you didn't go that direction. You went a different direction and you mentioned sports. I think you played basketball even at a collegiate level. What was it that, that drew you and, and these experiences that you had as a youth maybe confronting some of the legal system? What, what did that give you? Did that give you a different level of empathy or some sort of fire that drove you? Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I, do, I, I don't think that I necessarily have... I, I had parents that emphasize education. So if it's es- educational uh, attainment, I think I, I definitely had a, a household where there was an emphasis on that. Um, but I don't... Like I said, I do have friends that were definitely more like more acquainted with mathematics and science and writing and art um, that unfortunately didn't get that opportunity. And I do feel like that's probably across the board, you know, like we, I, I think we had a, a president that just was an office that, <laughs> that is a mediocre dude, right? But he just had a lot of opportunities presented to him. And so um, I, I think sometimes in life it's, it's, it's opportunity. And I don't think it's necessarily anything I especially like put myself and situated myself and planned that, I was going to be able to get an education and go to law school or, or anything like that. Um, I, I, I think a lot of the work that I definitely influenced this and I, hopefully I'm not skipping ahead, but it's related to my childhood. I think my best friend that I grew up with, um, he tragically died when I was two uh, L in law school. Um, and since this is going recording, I can officially put this on the record. That's the reason I got the lowest grade in law school in evidence is because <laughs> I went to his funeral. They asked, I, I got to speak at his funeral. Um, and of course, evidence is a tough class and you have to memorize all these things. And, um, and I didn't have the opportunity to really commit to memory all the mnemonics that you have to memorize with evidence. Um, but I went up to his funeral and um, spoke at his funeral. He had children and he died at 28 years old. Um, and he was a talented young man. You know, this guy was so talented, but I look back at um, just how they put him on a pipeline to prison. He did go to prison, you know, he did at a very young age and he was involved in the juvenile system as well. And we grew up like brothers. And and I think in law school, I kind of went to law school thinking I was going to do like work in like economic development or I don't know exactly what I had. my vision was. It's hard for me to really exactly remember what my goal and mission was, but um, that had such an impact on me as my a 2L that the next class I took, I saw a class in juvenile justice and I took that class as a, an elective course. Um, um, I started, I ended up becoming a guardian ad litem and representing children in uh, child dependency cases and representing children in delinquency cases as well. And so I, I look back on uh, Gable Dennis Sosi is his name, uh, his funeral, um, and I, and I went up there and I, had, I took my son with me. Actually, I have a 14-year-old, 15-year-old son. Um, and he at the time, he was just a little guy. And I took him up to the funeral because I didn't, I didn't have babysitting at the time either. <laughs> so he went to the funeral with me. Um, and so from Blanding, Utah to Albuquerque, New Mexico, it's about a five-hour drive. But oh. you drive through eight tribal communities in that drive. Oh, wow. um, and I, I could remember driving back to law school and, and crying. Uh, just because of the ubiquitous cracks that are in tribal communities that a lot of talented young native people are marginalized and and they fall through those ubiquitous cracks, you know, like that are gaping uh, in our community. And so um, definitely had a big impact on me uh, when I went back to school Uh, and just really being reflective of not necessarily about just the uh, great fortune that I had, I guess, of, uh, of having parents that emphasize education and and people in the community that believed in me and, um, and, and even Gabriel, you know, like growing up with him and, and he was, a he had more courage than, than me, you know, like I eventually learned the codes and, and switched to him, you know, this guy was just straight authentic all, all throughout his life, you know, and so and he, he went to jail for it, you know, he went, he, he suffered the consequences for it. So, um, so I don't think it's necessarily always honorable to be a code switcher, <laughs> but I, but I definitely probably am in some ways. Well, and there's certainly some instances where it benefits you to do that. So, I mean, I think um, I think you'd mentioned that you were close with your grandmother, um, and she might have helped you through some of those legal troubles. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of part of that story too. <laughs> I got um, I got kicked out of my house when I was in seventh grade. 
<laughs> kind of funny to say, but yeah, I went and lived with my grandmother and this is my non-native grandmother. Um, and I think that's probably, I look back to where if I learned any codes, it's probably living with her. Like she, um, I, le I learned so much and I was kind of. Where did she live? She lived in this uh, bedroom community of, of Og Salt Lake and Ogden, Utah. So um, Roy, Utah is the name of the, the town, which is kind of a funny place. But uh, but yeah, so she that's where I grew up. Uh, well, I lived there for a year. Uh, but I can remember my mom dropped me off up there. And, and I remember she was like, do what you should do. This is really good for a seventh grader is you should memorize your social security number. That's because you're going to have to sign a lot of papers. <laughs> So I basically like got myself into school and I like, I, I can remember like, I don't know, I had to grow up kind of really quick at that point in my life. And I learned, I learned a lot of things actually, like just, I think that translate to me as an adult. And I think that also had a big impact of who I was, but I, of course I got in some trouble up there. Um, and I remember going to court, um, and, and my grandmother went with me. Um, but I, and at the time, I've actually, as of now, I can look back and kind of understand a little bit more what was going on. Um, they put me on a diversion program rather than going through the court process. And so, like, I was able to get a plea in abeyance and just do community service, actually. And then the, that fell off, you know, like, and so, uh, and I didn't even have to go through probation. My grandmother was my, like, she signed off on my community service, you know, so I didn't even have to go through the, the formal system. And I think my grandmother... It, but for her being there, um, if I'd have shown up with my my brown father, you know, like definitely I, they would probably put me on a different track, you know, like I can remember definitively uh, the older judge was an old guy and he's looking at my grandmother and asked her questions and and my grandmother promised that they were going to give this young, young half Indian kid the tough treatment. He's going to do all his hours <laughs> and we're going to make sure he learns a lesson uh, and the judge uh, he said, yo, yeah, let's do that. Okay. Let's put him on this diversion track, you know? So, um, but it was, but for my grandmother being there that I would have, uh, I experienced that. Just curiosity, as, as you, as you tell that story and you say, we're going to put this little half Indian kid on the right track, did they actually refer to you as a half Indian kid or was it kind of just like implied? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm putting, I'm implying that, um, but I, I definitely okay. did feel that was a, the case, and, and I have felt that most of the time, like, I, I see people, my last name is a, a giveaway of, of my identity, um, so mm -hmm. I, I, I think I have felt that, and, and I, I felt, yes, I, I felt that in that instance as well, so. Mm -hmm. And the judge is directly addressing your, your grandmother and, and saying, oh yeah, this white lady can handle this issue, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and my grandmother was a no nonsense person, so she, um, she definitely wasn't faking that either. So <laughs> <laughs> that's who she was. <laughs> well, and Sheldon, with those different experiences, is is that something that really drew you to to uh, representing children and becoming a garden, guardian ad litem? Um, and did it also help you get some sort of uh, rapport or the ability to empathize with individuals that you wouldn't have had otherwise? For sure. Uh, absolutely. No doubt about it. Um, I, I just think back to some of the times like because I didn't I don't I didn't have really any legal mentorship when I first started. I can remember. And, and maybe I know a lot of people have, have that experience like they go to court. and They really don't know what the hell is even going on, you know, like and so I can remember the first case that I had. I didn't really know what the hell is going on. Um, it was actually a sentencing for a juvenile, and I kind of picked up the case in the middle of it. Uh, and he violated a plea in advance, <laughs> so like, um, so I'm in the middle of this case, and and I don't even know what the hell I'm supposed to be doing. But I can remember going in there and arguing. Uh, I'm throwing these arguments against the wall, but I, I I'm arguing that there is a disproportionality of brown kids being incarcerated, being thrown into detention. And the judge actually bought it. She gave me some love and she knew I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but she gave me some love and, and we got the lowest about that. He got two days in detention. But I remember actually after that, it's funny because when you talk about empathy, like I thought I lost everything for this kid, you know? So like, I remember talking to him after the court hearing and his grandpa was there and, and like, I'm getting kind of watery eyes as I'm telling him what's happening. Like, this is what's happening. And actually they're coming right now. They're going to be here and they're going to take you to detention right now. And I'm like, I'm getting kind of emotional. And the little kid, he's like 16 years old. He's like, oh, it's all right, man. I like the food over there anyway. It's, it'll be all good. <laughs> he's, like, he's, he's, he's comforting me. So maybe I had too much empathy, you know? Like, like, 
but yeah, so oh my goodness. there's a war story for you right there about not knowing what the hell's going on. Um, but <laughs> I think everybody has one of those, right? Where they're standing in front of the judge, fresh out of law school, and the judge asks some simple question like, would you like to waive advisement? And you look up, go, is this what most people do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, but let's see where this goes. <laughs> For me, it was it was uh, enter, entering my appearance at the beginning and saying my attorney registration number was just dumbfounding to me. I don't know why it was so hard. <laughs> what what court were you were you in at that point? That was actually so. That's the court that I was actually. Um, I'm a judge of now. So. so as an appellate judge, you're probably not having the chance to see those baby attorneys fumbling through their lives. Have you ever gotten to experience that? No, no, I have not actually. Well, I, I volunteer for this moot court thing some every year, and so uh, like I, so I get to see the the big saucer eyes coming before and, <laughs> and the shaky knees. Um, uh-huh. but, but yeah, for sure. And I I don't know. I learned a a lot in that. The other thing that I quickly learned, and I think this is influencing where I'm at now and my work that I'm doing, is that the child welfare system. And the juvenile delinquency system, juvenile justice, for that matter, they're broken systems. Um, and I and I felt quickly that you're you can have some impact, and so every once in a while you get a big win and you feel good about it. And you're like, yes, that wouldn't have happened, but for me being in the room, you know, but for me doing this, that would not have happened. We got a better outcome, and this kid's going to get a chance. Um, but by and large. Uh, you're spoken a broken will uh, when it comes to child dependency and and, and really families in this country, uh, primarily poor families and brown and black families in this country um, are getting a severe injustice when it comes to these systems. And so I'm trying to fix that will, if you will, um, that's ended up doing all this national work. And so I ended up working for a national nonprofit that was dedicated to reducing the amount of kids in foster care and, and trying to address those issues. A lot of the work that I do now is I, I work with ICWA courts. So the Indian Child mm-hmm. Welfare Act is a federal act that happens in state courts. Um, and one of the things, one of the principles of ICWA courts are gold standard attorneys. Um, and so to your point that you're talking about is we want attorneys to show up differently when they represent children and parents and the agency for that matter. County attorneys need to be uh, culturally and uh, humble in their representation as well, um, but also just exercise um, some anti-racism from their counsel's table mm-hmm. um, and look at their cases through an uh, equity lens. Um, so we're trying to teach lawyers motivational interviewing skills. Oftentimes you see that in psychology or counseling, um, but we're trying to teach lawyers to do that now so, mm-hmm. so they have better client engagement um, because of course your client, if they trust you, um, they end up and they feel like you're giving your voice in that proceeding, it ends up becoming, they feel closer to justice, even though justice, I kind of feel like is this floaty thing that we never really obtain, uh, but they at least feel that their voice is heard in that process, no matter if the process ends up going left or right or what it, wherever it ends up going, but keeping them engaged in that representation is really what we're trying to aim for, uh, eventually getting to better ends and better outcomes for uh, brown and black children in the foster care system. And I have a, a couple of, of topics that I really want to touch here. Um, the first of which is, and I'm not entirely sure how to ask this, so we'll see. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about ICWA, about what ICWA is, what it's for? Um, as you mentioned, it's the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, as a family law practitioner and as someone who's, who's worked in the juvenile system previously, um, I, I know some about ICWA, but essentially I know that it's, it's something that I think a lot of attorneys still don't have a very deep understanding of. And so if you can give us a little explanation for our listeners, that would be fabulous. For sure. Um, I, I have a cool story to tell you about this. And so like, I'll share this. Is that I got to write, I got to meet the guy that wrote ICWA. So there's three attorneys that worked wow. pen to paper and wrote ICWA. Um, and so I went to lunch with them one time in Manhattan, uh, right across the street from NYU Law School, in fact, actually. And so, uh, but it was one of those lunches that went from lunch, and then we also had dinner because we just sat around for so long and talked. Um, but Bert Hirsch is his name. Um, but in that, when I, 
asking him about his experience. As an attorney, he represented tribes, uh, parents uh, from east to west, north to south. He barnstormed the whole country, probably oftentimes practicing law without a license in a lot of jurisdictions. <laughs> um, but he's a, this guy was a change agent, you know, and like obviously he ended up helping write the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978. So it's 42 years old. Um, mm-hmm. But at the time, um, there's congressional findings that are with the Indian Child Welfare Act. So at the time, and you know, I'm going to throw some numbers out so you just kind of follow on these numbers. One out of three of all American Indian children were outside of their home, outside of their parents. Um, and so of those one out of three children throughout the whole country of American Indians that are not living with their parents, 90% of those children are placed with non-Indians. Um, mm-hmm. And so there were some explicit reasons why in this country, um, and if we go farther back, uh, there's an act, the first congressional act that intervened in Indian families and undermined Indian families was back in 18, 1819. Uh, there was an act Congress uh, enacted called the Indian Civilization Act. Um, and it gave money to churches to go to tribes, to tribal communities to, to civilize. It's very explicit to what that act was about, uh, to civilize American Indians. And they did this through removing their children um, and placing them, eventually placing them in boarding schools. Uh, where the explicit stated purpose of that was to save the man, kill the Indian, save the man. Um, so forced assimilation. Um, I have two sons myself, and I, I think about uh, not being a part of their lives and not seeing them grow. And, and there are some really poignant pictures in history where we could see parents camping outside of the fences of some of these boarding schools, you know, and and I imagine that would be me just to I would do it just to get a glimpse of my son, you know, just get a glimpse of my sons to see what they're doing, you know, like, um, and so those are some very painful pictures. There's also recently, maybe 10 years ago, Haskell, which is a school in Kansas, they were building a building there and they uncovered these baby handcuffs, like handcuffs that are for a child. Um, and so that's just an artifact of the forced assimilation project that the United States was on um, to de- undermine Indian families, to marginalize Indian families. Um, and so in 1878, that's when ICWA was passed. And of course, we see, we see all the elements of federal Indian law in this act. Um, Bert Hirsch, the guy that I had dinner with, he, he did tell me, and this is the point that I'm bringing up the story in the first place, is he did tell me, whenever you talk about ICWA, you need to tell everybody that that law is the only reparative law on the books uh, in child welfare. So it's the only law that is addressing a past wrong, a past historic wrong. Um, in the very vein of anti-racism, it's the only law in child welfare that is doing that, where it is trying to address and correct uh, all the children that were forced removed um, by, mm-hmm. by asserting a higher burden upon agencies when they remove children, that they have active efforts rather than reasonable efforts, uh, and that the agency continues to provide active efforts to reunify that family. Um, and at the time ICWA was passed, it was um, it was kind of a it was out in left field, and nobody else, no no other state age uh, state law even was close to that. But now, 48 out of 50 states also have kinship uh, placement requirements, and so that's another placement preferences within the Indian Child Welfare Act that we look to kin um, if the family is not safe. Uh, we look to mm-hmm. relatives for placement. Uh, zero states had that at the time it was passed. Uh, and now, like I said, 48 out of 50 um, do. So it has been become to known as the gold standard of child welfare for the, those reasons that we we try to make sure a child wins in those situations. Um, mm-hmm. So, and I, a lot of the work that I do is to teach state courts and attorneys uh, this area of law and, and really developing and building ICWA courts, um, like I was saying earlier, uh, to address, there is a two point, almost a three times disproportionality of the general population of Indian children in foster care right now today. Um, so really to help try to remedy that. That's, that's um, interesting. That's the only reparative law. And so has that decreased the incidence of um, Native children being placed with non-Native parents during those proceedings significantly? Um, no. <laughs> um, if you look at, so AFGARS, it's a, I, I forget the acronym every time, but it's, it's a federal database that 
tells the story of all the children in, that are in foster care. Um, so if we look at the AFCARs over the last 10 years, we actually see an increase of American Indian children going into foster care um, in the last 10 years. There is still a poor, uh, our court system, our legal system still does a terrible job on the front end of these cases. Um, because one of the aspects, one of the findings within an ICWA case is, a, is a, the inquiring of an Indian child, which is a term, which is a defined term within the statute. Um, so it involves asking that question, are you or anybody in your family an American Indian? Um, and also being able to send notice because uh, tribes have standing in those cases. So they get all legal notice. They get uh, an attorney, they get an appearance uh, in the, those proceedings and a voice in those proceedings. And so our, our system still does a terrible job on that front end of, of ICWA. That's disappointing. <laughs> yeah, it is. And we're, I think it is a training issue. Um, I think it's also an issue in America. And this is just my opinion. Uh, but I think in America, we still are trying to reconcile, um, I think, the two great sins of, of America, if you will. And that's enslavement of, of African-Americans. Um, and the great taking and genocide of American Indians, you know. So, like, I think those two original sins are are still outstanding, and we need to repair that. Uh, we need to reconcile that. And so, some of these issues when it comes to race in America, I think we we we're trained not to see them actually. Uh, and I was I was I went to Western schools just like you guys, and you know, so I don't think our education system necessarily helps us see these things. They actually teach us the opposite, that America is exceptional and we don't make mistakes. And, uh, and if, if we do, that they ended up being justified in the very end, you know, because uh, America is so great. We're not able to look ourselves in the mirror sometimes. Well, and you mentioned the, the genocide component, and I think you have a very personal story concerning that. You want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So here in the state of Colorado, um, this is Cheyenne country. There's, I don't know, about 40 tribes that have historical lands and uh, indigenous lands here in the state of Colorado, uh, the borders now of Colorado. Um, so Cheyennes, and we weren't always Northern and Southern Cheyenne. Uh, we were Tista people, you know, the people is what we called ourselves, you know. So um, we had a government and we had a legal system um, that was super organized, actually very very, very specific. Uh, 44 chiefs um, make up our parliamentary style government. Um, and so we had placement here in Colorado. We lived here in Colorado at the time, mostly like around Denver area, actually, and the plains going uh, eastward. And so through a series of treaties and a series of breach of treaty, honestly, in 1864, um, there was a group of Cheyennes under Chief Black Kettle um, and that guy was a humanitarian. I, I, I look at him and I read his story and that guy was, he was a good human being. You know, if you were disabled or you had intellectual disabilities or you're elderly or you're an orphan, you lived with his camp because he had so much humanity, um, he and his wife. And so he was the, the, the most human chief that we had. Um, they gave him a white flag and an American flag. And they said, if you raise this above your teepee, uh, you'll be safe. So he brought his his camp down to Sand Creek, which is by Eads, Colorado. Um, the other town that it's next to is a place called Shivington, Colorado, which ends up being named after um, Colonel Shivington, who was the guy that uh, led the Sand Creek Massacre of volunteer troops from Denver. Um, and this is probably one of the most gross and disgusting things in U.S. history is they surprised, uh, massacred, 700 sleeping Cheyennes on the morning of November 29th, 1864. Um, they killed over 200 Cheyennes and Arapahos that were there as well. Um, my family, and I was told this story, like I've been told this story since I was a child. This was something that was at my dinner table as well as um, the one that my surname, Spotted Elk, he was just a two-year-old boy at this time. And so I imagine he probably slept between his parents that night, you know, like most two-year-olds do. And um, and that we know this level of detail of the story it's passed through our oral, oral history is that uh, an older sibling or an older relative, a young girl saved him and took him up to, if you ever go down to Sand Creek, it's a, it's a national uh, historic site. 
they were going national park. If you ever go down there, it's, it's worth going down there. You, you need to go down there. Um, you walk those grounds, you can kind of see what happens. You know, there's like a little embankment of this dry creek bed. And, and the people that did survive, they ran up into that and, and they dug with their hands. Um, and you can imagine how cold and how hard that ground was that day. Um, and, and maybe how it broke their skin. Uh, but young Charles Spotted Elk was saved that day. Uh, but we know he was taken back to his dead mother, who was still nursing, and he got breastfed and they take him they they escaped 20 miles to the north uh, that morning um, and so these were stories that I was that I know so much about uh, it was told to me by my father who his father told him who in turn heard it from the person that lived it you know so um, that was told that all his life that this happened to him as a two-year-old this is why he's an orphan you know so even though that happened like you say oh 1864 that's so long ago um, if you talk, if you go up to Lame Deer, Montana, you would think that this happened 20 years ago. You know, it's still an open wound for us. You know, it's still something that we will never forget. You know, this was our 9-11 moment. Uh, so many 9-11 moments that Indian people have experienced. Um, but back to the, the, the people that committed that heinous act, they came back to the streets of Denver and, and received a parade, actually. And they had human rem remains, they, they cut the private parts off of men and women and they had those on their saddle bags and they paraded them down the streets uh, to a cheering crowd. Um, and so these are some things that I think we have to reconcile um, and, and build bridges to. And I, I think what you're talking about, Courtney, like you, you brought up empathy. And I think as an attorney, I think that's something we all need actually. And so we're, we're representing usually our clients, no matter what kind of representation we do, they, they usually come from diverse backgrounds for us and they have different reasons why they're engaging with the court system. Uh, and we're, we're our nexus. We are the nexus to that for them, you know, so having some empathy and understanding our client um, is always to our benefit, I think, and, and to their benefit as well. So, um, but especially in child welfare, where usually our parent client or our child client, they're not choosing to have us be their voice. <laughs> they're, they're forced in this process. They're involuntarily involved with this process and we are their voice, you know, so um, it's, it's a different, a little bit of a different dyna dynamic with the representation. Mm -hmm. And to that point, I'm I'm curious to hear. Um, so you said previously that you started off representing kids as a guardian ad litem um, in the court that you're you're now presiding over, um, which is a, a tribal court, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm curious to hear if you have any perspective on the difference in proceedings or just what it looks like to be in tribal court versus in in a district court or a county court. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that question. Um, so, yeah, of course, tribes are sovereign nations. Um, and so I think sometimes that's an education piece for everybody. So there's 578 tribes in this country. Uh, a lot of those tribes, I want to say 60% of those tribes are based out of Alaska or California. So there's a lot of tribes that are in those two states. Um, but there's about 400 tribal courts out there. So not every tribe has a court. Um, and just by the fact that they have a court, we know that they're adjudicating legal proceedings. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So tribes develop codes. Uh, and some tribes, I'll tell you, do better job. And a lot of my research, when I was in law school, I wrote a paper. It's actually published. It's in the Tribal Law Journal. Um, and it's about tribal constitutional reform. Can you tell um, us what your paper is called in case anyone wants to look it up? Um, I think it's called, I think it's not very creative. It's called Northern Cheyenne Tribal Constitutional Reform, I think. Okay. <laughs> I can't remember. It's, been a, it's like eight years. <laughs> but the, the reason I bring that up is to, to answer the question and to make the point is that um, at the time that tribes received constitutions, it was a fill-in-the-blank constitution. Um, so the Indian Reorganization Act of 1834 uh, um, provided that tribes develop constitutions. A solicitor from the Department of Interior wrote up a boilerplate constitution and gave it to tribes and say, write your guys' names in the blank spot. Um, and then, so the Northern Cheyenne Constitution, my tribe's constitution, there's something like 28 references to getting Secretary of Interior approval over law changes. 
Um, and, and you heard me before saying that we already had a legal system. We did have a legal system that was working. Um, it was it was solving our problems. You know, it was it was doing the job. Um, and so it really subverted our government structure and our legal process. Um, and of course, we all know that law works better when it's more proximate to values and people. Um, and so here we get an artificial overlay of, of this. If, if anybody came to us and said, now this is what you're doing, you know, we're going to have a really tough time with it, even if it's, especially if it's against our values, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, and that's what the position that American Indians found themselves in a lot of tribes found themselves in. And so the more we as tribes, as self-determination and, and tribes that exercise self-determination can change our laws to make them more proximate to us, uh, our values, the, the better our legal systems are gonna be. So it's really not, that's the whole premise of the paper. So it's not like, oh my goodness, uh, Call it, call it uh, Nobel, the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> I just got <laughs> onto something. Um, I'm just regurgitating something that everybody knows, you know, like, and there's a plenty of sources for this, uh, source material for this that's in Indian country and non Indian country. Um, so I think that's something really important for us to kind of be reflective of and, 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 and think about when we're developing codes. But to your, your answer, when it comes to dependency, um, my last plane ride that I took before COVID, before the coronavirus happened, it was, I went up to Barrow, Alaska. Um, mm -hmm. The tribal name, it's Inupiaq. Uh, it's, that's the people that live up there, but their tribal name for it is Galvik. I might be saying it, I know I am saying it wrong, but I tried my best, um, but it's Inupiaq. But I look at their code and it, it really is the, it's the city of gold, you know, it's the Eldorado of child welfare, honestly, because I've never seen in a child welfare code, the word love, in a code. Um, we often forget about that, you know, and so um, oftentimes parents are involved with, uh, in the system, they have addiction issues, and, and we sometimes take that away from them of re recognizing how much they love their child, even though they're suffering through trauma and addiction, uh, but it's explicitly stated in their code. Um, there's, as far as permanency goes, as far as the outcomes go, um, a lot of tribes do not have termination of parental rights in their code. Um, they have a suspension of rights um, and a customary adoption process that it, it's very similar to our permanent guardianship. Um, if we look at like how it happens mm -hmm. in Western systems. Um, but I think there's more psychological investment when we look at it through a customary adoption process. Um, adoption is, of course, tribes had adoption. Of course, we always had adoption. You know, that was something we always did. Um, and we think about it from our child's perspective, it was always for them to win, to get more parents, to get more adults into their lives, not to mm -hmm. sever the rights of their natural parents. Um, where we look at that, that's a brutal process. It's such an inhumane process. You know, it's mm -hmm. the civil death penalty, if you will. You know, that's what it's been called, you know. So, um, but you see a lot more humanity, I, in, in my um, opinion, in my reading of tribal codes when it comes to child welfare uh, than you see in Western systems. So much so that California has adopted tribal customary adoption in their state code, you know, so if California is the vanguard of, of law, <laughs> which mm -hmm. sometimes they're called that, they have adopted that in their state codes. Um, so uh, we need to start winding down here. And so I'm going to ask you, what's next for you? Who are you going to be? Uh, on that vein, and I kind of shared that with you, like I, I, I did some direct representation and I, I learned about the system. And, and I do believe that in order to have impact, not only in Indian law and in tribal law, uh, but it, especially in child welfare, um, you have to be a change agent. Right? You know, you have to be a, an agent of change and be willing to take that step forward when everybody is not taking that step forward. And so... I, I've worked in, also I was a chief of staff for a tribe, so I, I set the table for elected officials and made sure their resolutions and laws were carried out and tried to ordinate, organize and coordinate all of that. Um, I learned a lot during that process, but I think the next step that I, I want to do, and so kind of seeing it from a diff, diff, couple of different perspectives professionally, um, eventually I want to run for public office, and I don't know exactly what level yet, um, but eventually that's what I want to do is, is make sure that um, I get a chance to step in that arena and, and try to impact law and impact the system in that way. Um, I feel like that's the most permanent way of doing it. Um, 
There's other ways I know, of course, um, I think sometimes us in the legal arena think we're just where the buck stops all the time. But but if you look at some of the bigger changes in our society, they, they've been inspired by art, you know. Um, but unfortunately, I can't write a song or paint a picture well enough to really <laughs> inspire anybody. Uh, but definitely, I You're think... Funny. A <laughs> little bit, yeah. I guess I guess them, yeah. <laughs> Are your sons uh, very individual, spirited people? Uh, yeah, they are for sure. Um, they are for sure. I I was actually just saw, you know how you get those memories like seven years ago this happened. You know, like mm-hmm. on your social media, I got one of those today, and I and it's relevant. Uh, I re- I saw that I had to take my son to a a legislative hearing in Utah. Um, he was only a little, he was a little guy, um, but I gave legislative testimony about a resolution to, to recognize the American Indian Holocaust is, is the words that we chose to put in that piece of legislation that went through Utah, a very red state. Um, and we got it through. There's a resolution on the books in, I think, 2014. Um, and I got the first crack of writing that resolution. But as you see at the very end of it, the hot dog making process. And I learned a lot about the hot dog making process in that pro, uh, uh, being a participant of that. Um, it ended up being a little bit different of, of what we wrote originally. But um, I learned a lot. I interacted with a lot of elected officials in that process. Um, but, uh, but I think it's I, just looking at that with my boys, I got to take them along with that. It's one of the cool experiences that I've been able to have is bring them and have them see their dad give testimony on the Senate floor in Utah, you know, so it's kind of a cool experience. Wow. You definitely are a change maker and you would be an excellent public servant in office. (laughs) Well, -hmm. well, thanks, Courtney. When I need those donations, I'm going to give you. (laughs) (laughs) My donations are words. (laughs) Awesome. Perfect. Um, I I need those words. Thank you. (laughs) And it sounds like you're an amazing influence on your kids too. And they're going to be the next generation of awesome change-making people. Uh, I, I I think pandemic has taught me this about my kids. Like I don't want that. They don't need to be exceptional. I just want them to be happy. Um, so it's really given me a different perspective. So they don't need to love that take on the world or anything. And they both play instruments and that makes them really happy. And so whatever they do to make them happy, it's fine. So I don't, they don't need to go out and take on the world or anything like that. So, What an exceptional life you've had and so many experiences and really appreciate the time you've taken to share with us and we can share with all of our listeners. Absolutely. Thank you to you both, Linda and Courtney. This has been Our Voices. For more information on today's guest or to get involved, please check out the CBA podcast page at cobar.org slash podcast. That's C-O-B-A-R dot org slash podcast. This podcast series was created by members of the Colorado and Denver Bar Associations. Our Voices is a collaborative effort of the EDI Joint Steering Committee messaging team, including Mallory Revel, Linda Moss, Bonnie Schreiner, Mallory Hasbrook, Mo Watson, Mario Trimble, Courtney Holm, and Emmy Lopez, with our CBA Communications Team Director, Heather Folker, and Manager, Charles McGarvey. Our recording engineer is Rick Pontelion of Lionsbridge Recording. Our producer and editor is Courtney Holm, with theme and introduction by Mario Trimble. This podcast is made possible because of the support of the Colorado and Denver Bar Associations. On behalf of all of us, thanks for listening to Our Voices. Thank you.